Now, what are some of the challenges, right? So say that you're basically building up an electric car or, uh, you know, you want to work in a company that uh, does electric vehicles. What are the challenges that these companies are facing currently? Well, four challenges, right? You can uh, basically condense all the existing challenges to just four categories. First is the range anxiety, right? Uh, I hope everyone knows what range anxiety is. It's basically like you're taking your electric vehicle and it says that, you know, you can still go 500 kilometers. Do you actually believe it? And what happens if there is no charging station nearby, right? That makes you anxious, obviously. And that's what you call as range anxiety. So that affects customers a lot. And as an, as an automaker, companies like General Motors, Ford and Tesla, they have to constantly think of ways to make sure that the customer's range anxiety goes away. And that is why, you know, they are basically doing things like building supercharger stations where, you know, they provide uh, electricity at an unbelievable price. So here's a fact. As of today, if you're in the US and if you own a Tesla, the cost of going 250 miles, right, which is about, if, I, if I'm being approximate, uh, I believe it's going to be around 400 to 450 kilometers. The cost for going 450 kilometers using a Tesla, which is fully electric, and if you compare the cost against a normal vehicle, going on a Tesla is 10 times cheaper. Now it's 10 times cheaper because Tesla is actually subsidizing the price, but that's the reality today. That's what makes the people in the US uh, really eager to get the car if they can afford it, because it's really cheap. Um, the operational expenses of owning a Tesla are much less when compared to a traditional car. The second thing is vehicle integration, and this is a problem that directly affects the OEMs. So you have the battery pack, you have all the cables and you have your electric motor, your reducer, your control systems. How do you actually place these various components in a car? How do you integrate them with the vehicle so that at the end of the day, you are not compromising on safety and you're not compromising, compromising on packaging and you're still making the car easy to repair, right? So that uh, maintenance costs are not that high, right? So this is what vehicle integration means. Next comes performance engineering, right? Uh, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, your car travels fast. It gives you good mileage, right? No one wants to have an electric vehicle which can travel only 10 kilometers, right? Maybe 300 or 400 kilometers, it should travel fast. And the battery pack uh, should be highly reliable, which means, uh, you know, five years down the line, it should still give me the same performance, right? These are the expectations from the customers. Then comes safety engineering, which is extremely applicable for both gasoline and for electric vehicles, which is if you encounter a crash, does the car keep you safe? Is your car durable? Meaning after two years down the line, is there a chance that your battery pack uh, would catch fire? You know, are there issues like that? These are important questions that people ask. And except for range anxiety, the other three challenges are first felt by the OEMs and they are slowly transitioned into the people who's actually buying the car, which is the customer, correct? So moving on. So let me kind of talk about how these challenges are met and how different engineering teams are actually working towards fixing this problem. Uh, and this is where all you guys, especially if you're a mechanical uh, automotive or a manufacturing engineer, you need to pay attention to the following slides because these are the skill sets that employers are soon going to expect from you. You know, when it comes to range anxiety, one of the things that people do is uh, they look at proper electrode and cell design. So this is where you're actually going into the electrochemistry of the battery and you're trying to modify it by performing detailed fluid simulations and surface chemistry simulations to improve the range of the battery. Now this is done in today's industry by people who have done either mechanical or chemical engineering. At the end of the day, the reason why they do this, they do this is at a cell level. Now when I say, when I say cell, what do I mean? Well, you take up your TV remote you have your AA or AAA batteries, right? That's what you call as a cell. In a car, you take thousands of these cells and you create a battery pack. Now, when we say energy density, we talk about the amount of energy available from a single cell. So this is called cell level energy density. I hope that makes sense. Now you look at this energy density at the cell level, and then you take all these cells and you create battery packs. So if you remember the video that we saw, you had these rectangular units, right? These are called as battery packs. You need to look at the energy density at a pack level as well. And then you need to address the various thermal management uh, issues. What does thermal management issue mean? Well, to put it very simply, if you take your battery packs, the batteries is going to heat up because you know they're generating electricity 
and they are in a closed container where there is not a lot of airflow. So that's going to result in uh, severe heat up of the batteries. Now batteries uh, should not continuously heat up because there is a risk of fire and uh, fatal accidents. So you need to maintain the batteries at the right temperature. So this is one level of thermal management. The second thing is from a performance point of view. In order to get uniform performance from a battery pack, you need to make sure that all the cells in your battery pack are at a uniform temperature, more or less. And this is achieved by cooling uh, the batteries. And this is where a mechanical engineer or an automotive engineer comes and designs cooling systems for the battery packs. So then let's talk about vehicle integrations. Well, say that you are a startup and you're making electric vehicles today and you want to make it for uh, the Indian market and say that you're from Chennai, Bangalore or Mumbai or Delhi, you want to first launch your uh, electric vehicle startup in one of the cities. Which configuration would you go for? Would you go for a non-plug-in hybrid, a plug-in hybrid, a mild plug-in hybrid, a battery electric vehicle, or some other weird combination, right? Because the choice that you make is going to affect the perception of the end customer, right? And at least for India, it's very safe to say that you have to go for a plug-in based model because you still don't have a large number of charging stations that's you know commercially available for uh, consumers to make, right? But these are some things that you need to understand. Uh, the second thing is when you're putting everything together, how easy is it for you to manufacture your entire electric vehicle? Now, for those of you who have been um, following Tesla, one of the terms that you commonly see in their blog posts is called as the production hell, right? Now, <clears throat> there have been a lot of technical reviews on their production system and people have claimed that there are several processes that they are actually following, which makes it very hard for them to design for manufacture. In other words, the designs are made in such a way that the manufacturing processes take much more time. And one of the reasons quoted by many people is that Tesla makes all of its own parts. Whereas a typical company like your Ford, General Motors or Maruti, suppliers make most of the components, thereby parallel processing the entire thing. And then also using their existing experience, correct? Because a supplier usually works for more than one automotive companies sometimes, right? So they have more rich experience and they can get the job done quite easily. But Tesla, as of today is not doing it. And hence, on a design for manufacturing point of view, they don't do well. Uh, there's a quick question. What is meant by architecture? Uh, that, it's, a, it's a very simple question. And the answer is also very simple. Say that you're making an electric vehicle today, right? Now, do you want a battery pack and an IC engine? Or do you just want a battery pack? Or do you want a battery pack that can be charged using a charging cable? Or do you want a battery pack that can be charged as the engine runs? These are the four combinations that are available. And this is what you call as the architecture. Because depending upon the architecture that you choose, your performance parameters are going to be completely different. I hope that makes sense. The other three components that actually come into play for an electric vehicle is optimizing the wires, right? You have a large number of high voltage cabling throughout your electric vehicles. You need to make sure that they are routed correctly because uh, whenever there's high voltage going through a cable, it possesses a safety risk and then it can cause a magnetic field that can affect other electronic components. So that's what you call a signal routing and separation. You need to take care of that. And at the end of the day, your vehicle should be easy to repair. Like in order for you to do your routine, you know, fixes, you should not take a lot of time. The vehicle has to be built like that. That's one of the reasons why the battery pack is underneath because it can be removed with relative ease. If the battery pack is kind of built inside, it's going to be very hard for people to actually remove the battery pack, right? Then in addition to this, when it comes to vehicle integration, you have to ask questions like which architecture is better for my fuel economy and emission standards? driving performance, like what's the peak speed, what's the total mileage, and uh, at the end of the day, is it a comfortable uh, ride for the passenger? Do I get a lot of noise? Now, electric vehicles in general are really quiet, right? So that's one of the advantages. But because of the uh, various electronic components that are involved, and if they're not configured correctly, you can actually get a really high frequency whine from your electric motors, which is going to be really like a high pitch sound, which can be extremely annoying. And in general, when you buy an electric vehicle car, right, you immediately think in your mind that it's going to be extremely quiet. So the automaker has to understand uh, your perception and they have to make the cars accordingly. Then it comes to performance engineering, where you basically balance three components. You're balancing driving comfort, 
optimizing the fuel economy range and you're controlling emission. Now it's just three points, but it's very hard to do. Finally, safety, we already talked about it a couple of times, like optimizing the battery pack, the powertrain safety. You know, you have a lot of electromagnetics, thermal and structural components. They have to be durable. And then a very important thing that's unique for electric vehicles is the operational integrity. You have high voltage cabling and connectors. If you are really, uh, if you slack on their designs, it can be a nightmare for the durability of the vehicle and it can be highly fatal. So how are these challenges overcome? Well, digitization or what I like to call as analysis led design. This is one of the things that's actually happening in a lot of industries. Like what does this mean, digitization? Well, let me show a simple slide. You know, 10 years before you had bookstores, you have Amazon now, you had, C you had, you had a market for CDs and DVDs, maybe still there is, but now most people watch movies on Netflix or Amazon Prime. Taxis, you have Ola's, and as I like to say it, you had colleges before, there are still some colleges, now Skilllink is the alternative. But di digitization is always going to be there. And if you're not digitizing your business, it can actually kill your business. You know, think about other alternatives, right? People who are doing, who are selling books before Amazon and who are doing a great job. And there was one company called Barnes and Nobles. They're not doing that well now. And before Ola, you know, there were a lot of taxi services which are not doing very well, right? So digitization in electric vehicle development process is extremely important. And this is, uh, it's basically used while designing all the components. So what do I mean by digitization? Here, well, it's basically using computer-based simulation tools for rapidly prototyping, designing, and simulating your product. So that is what digitization means. So at the end of the day, uh, you have all these inputs. You know, you have your HVAC systems, control systems, electronics, battery packs, electric motor, and cooling systems that you want to optimize. And you want to optimize, you want to get the right performance, you want to get the right comfort, re reliability, drivability, and NVH. And the balance, the thing that balances all of this is your computational tools. So it's extremely important for an young engineer to equip themselves with all the computational tools that's out there as much as possible so that they can understand this balance and you know they would be a great asset to any automotive company. And if you did not know, more than 20 CAE tools, right, computer-aided engineering tools are used in the wake development process by a single company, right? So if there are different companies out there, then each companies might have a different set of tools. All right, so let's talk about some CA tools, starting with the battery management system. Now I know that most of you are mechanical, automotive or manufacturing engineers, and this might seem like something for an electrical engineer, but trust me, as you move forward, you need to be in a position to understand all these things. So here, what you're looking at, here, what you're looking at is a battery management system and you're looking at a system level model of the same, which was done using Simulink. So in this particular case, what we have here is we have uh, three lithium ion cells and we are basically putting them inside uh, a single battery pack unit. Now, in this particular case, what I'm interested in doing is I'm basically interested in charging these three lithium ion cells using a very common approach called as the constant current and constant voltage approach. So the idea is, uh, you know, let me just zoom in to this a little bit. So you have these batteries, right? So what you do is you initially pass constant current till the set operating voltage is reached, right? After this voltage is reached, then a constant voltage is used to charge. Now I understand that this might not be very clear since most of you are not electrical or electronic student, but the thing is you need to start understanding these things. The second thing is in this particular thing, like you can see that the same unit is repeating itself. So you have this initial circuit, that same circuit is getting repeat, uh, it's just repeating itself. In general, what's going to happen is in a real car, you will have a large number of cells. Now all these cells will not have the same amount of charge, right? They are going to have different levels of charge. So the, the standard practice is very simple, right? Uh, you first need to make sure that all your cells are basically at the same level of charge and then you need to start filling them. It's kind of this, if, if whatever I'm saying right now doesn't make sense, here's an alternate picture for you. Imagine that you have three glasses of water and all the three glasses have different level of water. Make sure that the water is filled at the same level. After that, you start drinking the water, right? It's kind of the same concept. You need to make sure that the batteries are initially charged at the same level before you move to the next step. So in this particular case, the concept of charging the individual batteries to a point where all these cells in the same battery pack 
are at the same charge level is called as passive balancing. And the passive balancing is done by using what you call as a resistor. I'm assuming that you all recognize this symbol. This is a resistor. This is what you call as a bleed resistor. So what it does is say that this cell has the highest amount of charge. Then the bleed resistor is going to basically help this battery lose some charge so that it's basically at the same level of uh, the other cells. All of this is done using something called as the mode logic, uh, which is basically this particular unit where, uh, you know, you're saying that, okay, this, uh, this is the rule that you need to follow to make the passive balancing happen. Now, in addition to this, all of these cells are actually thermally coupled, right? Now, this is where mechanical engineering in, is coming into play. You're basically connecting these two things and you're saying that they're thermally connected, right? So what is the conductive resistance? What's the convective resistance? Well, as a mechanical engineer, you need to program into this model, right? And this is where suddenly you are basically dealing with a model that was developed by an electrical engineer and you have to work in it, right? So this is what I call as cross-functional multi-domain experience. Extremely important and that is where the industry is heading towards.